Dr. Jim Mason is a nuclear physicist. He's a Canadian, uh, recently retired, and uh, doing some volunteer work for uh, Creation Ministries International. And as a nuclear physicist, you've got quite a background. Uh, I find it a little intimidating, actually, uh, that term, nuclear physicist. Um, <laughs> how does one ever decide to become a nuclear physicist? Well, it, it sort of grew on me in high school. Uh, when I was in my early high school years, I, first I wanted to be an RCMP officer. I thought that would be kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, and then that changed. I wanted to be a park ranger. I kind of liked the outdoors. And then I had my first physics class and I knew I wanted to study physics. I didn't really get to the nuclear physics part of it until I got into university. I took engineering physics initially, uh, and then as I got to the nuclear physics part, I thought that was really interesting, uh, so I took my uh, doctorate in nuclear physics. Uh, I didn't unfortunately get much chance to work in the field because uh, the jobs had pretty well dried up by that time. <clears throat> so I wound up working in the defense electronics field for 37 years. Now, uh, tell me a bit about that, defense electronics. Uh, are you talking about uh, some of the uh, communication systems or that sort of secret cyberspace thing that, go that goes on in terms of spying in other countries or all of the above? Well, not the latter at all. No. Uh, I did some work on communication systems in the last half of my career. Uh, first half of my career I spent um, developing acoustic systems, passive acoustic systems to detect and track Soviet nuclear submarines. That's kind of as close as I got to do in nuclear physics after I graduated. Really? And how does nuclear physics uh, apply to, to uh, something as mechanical as tracking uh, submarines? Well, we didn't use any of the nuclear physics part. They, it would just happen to be that the submarines were powered by right. nuclear reactors. Right. And we used acoustics uh, to actually detect and track them. Working in that field for, for 37 years, um, I'm sure that on this side of it, you know a lot more about uh, nuclear physics than you knew at the beginning. Uh, what was one or two of the most astonishing things you learned in the process about uh, your area of discipline? Well, interestingly enough, the most interesting things that I've learned, I've learned in the last few years from reading creationist uh, research material. Really? Uh, yeah, the, the work that was done by the rate group uh, which are a group of scientists uh, that got together under the auspices of ICR to look at radioisotopes and the implications for the age of the Earth. Some of the work in that was just fantastic, just really, really interesting. Now, I want to get into that with you, uh, but I, I want to do that in the latter half of the interview. I, uh, because I, I was intrigued in an article I read about you when you talked about the uh, three fundamental particles that, uh, that make up rea uh, you know, the, the physical world as we know it and how those three, those three particles can then subdivide into what, another 12, is it? Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, whatever. Uh, when you talk about particles, what, what do you mean? Uh, well, uh, they come at different levels, right? I mean, they're the, the kind of, the, if you like, normal particles that we, we mostly know about, like neutrons, protons, and electrons, but they themselves are made up of even more fundamental particles, and, and those are the particles uh, that I was talking about in, in that article. Um, quarks, for example, uh, they'll show quarks and quarks. Yeah. Uh, well, that's where, they, that's where they come from. Now, so is a quark a reality or is it still a... Um, no, it's a reality. It's, it's not a, a theory anymore. No, no. It's their, they can explain a lot in terms of these three fundamental particles that come in a number of variants. And it doesn't matter what we're dealing with, whether it's... Uh, uh, an animal or a tree or uh, a mountain, uh, you're going to find these, these particles in some form. Yes, because they're inside the neutrons and the protons that are inside the nuclei that are inside the atoms of everything. Right? And that's, that's what I found so fascinating about that is that there are so few of those fundamental particles, but they have just the right properties to make everything we see. Mm. So the, the idea of making so much diversity, so much variability with a very small number of fundamental elements, to me, is as an engineer, I was a practicing engineer for many years, is just an incredible ex example of superb design. So, uh, and I'm just a layman here, so help me with this. Uh, in, in terms of our, if you will, particular makeup, uh, we would have as much in common with a mountain as we do with an ape. 
Well, at the quark and quark level, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's what I mean. You get down to the fundamental particle level. The fundamental particle level. There, everything is made out of these three basic types of fundamental particles. Do you suppose in the evolutionary uh, uh, worldview, uh, we've chosen apes as our ancestors because they're the ones that look most like us? There may have been some of that originally. I, I think now the, the focus is on the genetic composition right. and that they, they do it with looking at the genomes and, and that sort of thing. Right. But that's not my area of expertise. No, no, I, 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 no I'm not going to. I, I have a geneticist coming by here uh, shortly. Yeah. I, that'll be Dr. Carter. I heard, uh, heard I've had Dr. Week. Carter and oh. I've got Dr. Sanford coming. Right. In. I heard Dr. Carter last yeah, week. Yeah, terrific. It was amazing. Um, now, in terms of these. Pr particles and, and they're, the way they're designed to produce what they produce. There's, f uh, f you say, four forces that are contributing to all of this. The strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, uh, force electromagnetism, force and force gravity, gravity. Right. which gravity, I was surprised to discover, is the weakest of them all. Correct. But, j just but acts over the longest distance. Uh, yeah. Now, now <laughs> how, uh, go figure that one. Yeah. It can be the weakest and yet acts over the longest distance. Right. So now, and it's also the one force that, that is not well understood in terms of the mechanism. Um, the other forces are well understood in terms of how they, they work in terms of these fundamental particles. But the force of gravity, the under, best understanding of it is that it's a distortion of the fabric of space that's caused by mass. And then that causes other masses to move through the distorted fabric in a particular way. You know, when you, when you speak this way, and I, I got the impression in reading uh, several books in preparation for this series of interviews, the impression you get is the fact that uh, life in its amoebic form, let alone life in its complexities as we know it exists, is a miracle. I mean, really. Well, I, it, it, but it is. <laughs> it, it is a miracle. And, and this, of course, is, is part and parcel to, uh, you know, your perspective as a creationist, that there has to be intelligent design. Yes. And, and more than that, a personal designer behind it all. Yes, exactly. Now, you didn't always believe this. I did not. Um, I, I, sad to say, I grew up in the church. I went to Sunday school and church every weekend with my mom and dad. Um, but by the time I got into high school, I hadn't, as far as I can remember, really heard the salvation message coherently expressed. So uh, when I graduated from high school and went off to university, of course, I took Geology 101, first year of engineering, and whoa, that's interesting, all these long ages. And I had a subscription to Scientific American, and that was about the time the Big Bang was becoming popularized. And as a physicist, I thought that was really cool. So I kind of abandoned at least practicing my faith. I didn't really think about it very much um, until I was about 40. And I'd gone back to church in the interim because I got married and had children and, you know, we wanted our children to go to church, as many people do. Um, and then eventually got invited to a, a Bible-preaching, Bible-believing church where I heard the gospel message and the message of salvation and accepted Jesus. And that was when I was about 40.